Um, and if you would say um, who you are. The, and if we could also comply with the usual house rule of uh, questions and not speeches. Thanks. Smita. Um, great. So I'm Smita Nakuda, and I lead our work on climate finance here at, at ODI. Um, and I... I'm tempted to ask you more about the 100 billion, but I'm going to pick up on your on your observation around the role of, of finance beyond the 100 billion. And I'd be curious to hear your views on the role that an agreement can play in sending the signals to the international community around the imperative of greening investment flows as the key piece of the implementation agenda post-2016 and what you see the prospects around that as being more central to a post-2015 agreement look like. Thank you. And then the person right next to you. Uh, thank you. Simon Ratliff from DFID. I'm in the Climate and Environment Department. Um, I'm glad that, uh, and it's obviously no surprise that the issue of cities came up in, in, in the context of your being here. Um, this has also been something that I've been, <coughs> sorry, that I've been working on. The one word that seems to be missing from the narrative around cities and, and the infrastructure that's required that you speak of is the word design. Uh, because the design of the infrastructure is absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. And if we leave that word out, um, we're not um, addressing who does the design and where the design comes from. Yeah. So uh, just, you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that because I, I really think it's critical that we, yeah. we, we focus on it. Thanks, Simon. If you could just pass it, my friend, right behind you. Uh, thank you. <coughs> it's working. It's okay. Uh, Peter Greaves, UNA. Uh, Lord Stern, some months ago, you and half a dozen other noble lords put your name to the Global Apollo Program. Could you kindly tell us how that is faring? You had expressed the hope that it would be accepted by governments before Paris and implemented immediately afterwards. I'd like to know what's happening, and in particular, is the British government really supporting this? Okay, so um, why, why don't we start with those, Nick? I mean, I guess, I guess the, the question that Smith asked is a really important one. That is there a, a signaling from Paris that can shift the incentives that you were describing for urban planning and the low carbon tr future for cities? And then the, the, next, the next question will be on adaptation after that. Would you, that. Uh, okay. I, the, if, if the person I'm suspect, I want to ask a question doesn't ask it, I'll ask it myself. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so why, why don't we start I, with, I, with I think I, I began the answer to your question and, I, and you really picked it up in the way you expressed it. Uh, in terms of Paris being a turning point and sending, sending a new sense of direction, albeit we wished, you know, the turning point, if you like your mathematics, it would have been nice if the uh, second derivative was still more strong than uh, it was, is. Um, so we want to accelerate away from Paris. But if, if we get that sense of direction, and I'm genuinely hopeful that we will get the agreement and that it will be interpreted that way and the ODI will correctly help it to get interpreted that way. That, that is your duty, as they say in India. And um, then people will ask themselves the question, if I'm building something that lasts 20, 30, 40 years, I'm imagining not the world in the next three or four years, of course, that comes into it, but I'm imagining the world 30 or 40 years down the track. So in mid-century, we're going to have to be pretty close to zero emissions from electricity. That should be, should be the world. Will my project look good in that kind of world? Will it make strong revenues in that kind of world? And the more people answer that, ask the question in that way, Harris will help them, I hope, to see actually the things that are going to do really well are the extremely energy efficient, the things that make cities uh, really attractive and productive and un, uh, uncongested, that don't pollute. Uh, the atmosphere that have close to zero emissions. And if they see that as the world 20, 30, 50 years from now, that should um, change the whole way in which people think about investments. Now, crudely, you can say, well, you wouldn't want to build assets that are going to be stranded uh, in uh, 15 years' time. Um, or 
10 or 20 years' time if you're thinking about these very big long-term investments. So I hope that kind of signal will be there. The design of cities is indeed very important. Um, I'm sure you've read the report of September last year of the new climate economy, Better Growth, Better Climate. Um, James will give you a free copy if you, uh, if you haven't. But the design of cities was absolutely at the heart of that story. Uh, we gave the very telling example of uh, Atlanta and Barcelona, two cities with more or less the same population, more or less the same income per capita, but um, Atlanta has something like six or seven times the transport emissions, and they're very big, than Barcelona. And if you ask people, let's do a little poll, if you were offered to live the rest of your life in Barcelona or Atlanta, <laughs> those in favour of Barcelona, <laughs> the overwhelming majority, and, and, uh, and I ask for the understanding of all our friends in Atlanta who are watching this, uh, <laughs> this program. The design of city is absolutely fundamental, not just to the emissions, not just to the quality of the air you breathe, but their productivity and their attractiveness. And those are design issues. Now, if we've got three billion people moving into cities compared with perhaps three and a half billion now, three billion over the next 35 years or so, we are in a position to think hard about design. We could actually think hard about design in the cities that we already have. I mean, on Monday I was in Seville talking to, to people and the centre of town is a beautiful pedestrianised area. You walk around the centre of Vienna, it's a beautiful pedestrianised area. And people go there because it's a very attractive place to be. So those are existing cities and the cities that are expanding and changing, the design is absolutely central. And uh, that's why I think the gathering of mayors in Paris around Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, is a very big part of uh, this story. We're talking to the Treasury and the uh, Northern powerhouses. That should be, you know, we've got six now decentralized uh, or potentially decentralized uh, cities <coughs> in the UK. Liverpool and West Midlands announced by the Chancellor and Jim O'Neill at the beginning of this week. Those are moments when you can really change the uh, change the design. So it's, I, I, I'm just taking a long time agreeing with you um, and but trying to talk about some of the uh, specifics. The Apollo uh, story, um, it, it's somewhat being, being accurate but somewhat facetious. It was actually six lords and a knight. And uh, the lords were uh, myself and Richard Layard and Gus O'Donnell, Martin Rees, John Brown and Adair Turner and the knight who actually did all the work um, was David King. And David is the representative of the uh, Foreign Secretary on Climate Change. So he is an employee of Her Majesty's government. But you asked about Her Majesty's government. But at least one employee of Her Majesty's government is very enthusiastic because Dave was essentially Dave King, the one who uh, took the lead in designing it. The, uh, I think it's fair to say it's had a lot of traction. There are a lot of other uh, ideas about how to expand innovation. On November the 30th, which is a week on Monday, on essentially the first day of the COP, um, President Obama, Prime Minister Modi and uh, Bill Gates um, will announce a major innovation program. I hope that's going to be followed by other countries um, setting out what they're going to do. But I think the targets that we were suggesting for investment in energy, at least doubling it, uh, are very important targets. And uh, the second thing which we emphasized very strongly was collaboration. So I don't think it will be exactly the Apollo program as written, but that would be adopted in any sense. But I do think the ideas that were there are, have been helpful in bringing this, but along with lots of other strands in, in that discussion. And I do think targets and coordination, which we emphasize very strongly, are things that we should emphasize very strongly in the discussions in, uh, in Paris. Let's go to this side.
Thank you. It's uh, John Garrett from WaterAid. Um, I'd just like to, to ask around the uh, climate finance flows, and in particular, I think some of the early research that we've done at WaterAid has, uh, um, has identified the fact that much of the finance that has started to flow is really going to middle-income countries rather than low-income countries and least developed countries. And I'd be interested in, in hearing Professor Stern's views on, on how, how we can build the capacity, particularly of, of low-income countries, particularly vulnerable ones, um, so that they're able to absorb some of these large amounts of finance which uh, are going to be coming on stream in, in greater numbers uh, post-2020. Thank you. And, and perhaps very quickly, just related to that, um, the issue of, 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 of loan and grant finance. And um, really, I think, uh, for those of us who many years ago were sort of working on the uh, the debt crisis around the, the millennium, I think that there must be genuine fears that these very large sums of money, the trillions that you're talking about, particularly in low-income country contexts, could actually start building debt unsustainability. Thanks. The person right behind you. Virginia Murray, Public Health England, but also Vice Chair of the United Nations International Strategy on Disaster Reduction Scientific and Technical Advisory Group. Lord Stern, you made the comment that extreme events are one of the major impacts from climate change. It is something that rarely worries us. We think it's about 70% of the extreme events are related to climate change now. And we're concerned that the links may not be as clear as they might be to the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, which was also agreed as a UN landmark agreement this year. Is there any chance that the COP agreement might link more clearly to the Sendai framework? Is there anything we can do to try and facilitate that? Thank you. Um, coming around, are there initial questions? Good, that gives me an opportunity to throw in the adaptation question, <coughs> which relates a little bit to the, um, the, the issues that the uh, colleague from WaterAid raised. That, you know, the, the thing that strikes me, Nick, is that if you look at the adaptation architecture under the UN system and, and beyond and in the World Bank actually. There, there, there are two things that stand out about it, which is one, it's incredibly fragmented. You know, six different or seven, whatever the number is, different facilities operating almost entirely on a project by project basis. So not looking at climate risk in a systemic fashion and the link between climate risk and poverty, but trying to fund small projects. Uh, with, with most of the money going to countries that don't necessarily need it the most. You know, a lot of resources going to middle income, low middle income and middle income countries even. And it, it, it strikes me as a classic example of where we've ended up with a very perverse financing architecture for a very real development problem. That it, you know, it's almost become a sort of, I'm not speaking, this is not an ODI position, but it, you know, it does strike me that there's a sort of ghettoization of a adaptation that's somehow different than managing the, the sort of the deeper climate risk that millions of people are dealing with every day, including the, the, the extreme event risk. So maybe you could um, roll reflections on adaptation in, into the responses. Yeah. Let me take that first because it actually relates to the responses I'd want to give to the others. For much of what we should be thinking about, clean and climate resilient development, sustainable development in that sense. It's those two things. And of course it's development um, in terms of rising capabilities, living standards, education, health, income and so on. Um, adaptation, mitigation and development in most, I'll go so far as saying most of the examples we deal with, certainly many, um, their adaptation, mitigation, development are intertwined. And let me give a few examples. Um, if you think of um, the system of root intensification for, for rice, where you um, manage your paddy fields in a way that um, uh, you don't flood them, uh, you, you irrigate, but you don't flood. And it depends on how you transplant and the gaps between them and how you look after it and how you look after the weeds and so on. But essentially that's the idea is that you look after the roots much more carefully than you would do uh, in, a way, in a model where you put them much more closely together and flood. That saves water and it saves energy because a lot of <coughs> water is large part energy. So it saves energy and water and uh, that's development. It uh, saves uh, on methane emitted from the flooded 
uh, paddy fields, and it makes them more robust. Let me give you another example. About three years ago, I, I presented the, some prizes for innovative projects uh, for Cristiana Figueres at one of the COPs. And one of them, it was absolutely magnificent, it was from the Philippines, is you take your hut, which has basically got no windows, I mean, a very crude structure, you make a hole in the top, you put a plastic bottle in the top, and you've got daylight. And uh, so you save, because otherwise you're burning kerosene in there all the time. So that's good development, because you're saving on the kerosene and you're saving on the cost of inhaling the residue from the uh, kerosene. So it, it's development. It's mitigation. You're not burning the kerosene. And it's robust in that you've just got sunlight doing your lighting. You're not dependent on some supply chain of whatever else it might be. That's a very, very simple example. But you can see if you put examples like that together, and it's crucially important to integrate adaptation, mitigation, and development. And what I'm very fearful of, and I did, I worked as chief economist at the EBRD and then chief economist at the World Bank for a total of 10 years. And we know how bureaucratic silos can be. Maybe ODI is big enough to be siloed already. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, these, organi these organizations are genuinely siloed. And if you put adaptation in the pot over here and development in your mainstream and mitigation somewhere else, you know, of course you can sort of weave them together and a really good person, entrepreneurial person in that organization will do it. But you're making life much more difficult and making it much less likely that you integrate. And of course you're changing not only your mindsets, but the mindsets of others that sort of pull these things apart and it's very dangerous. Um, whether you look at transport or lighting or agriculture or you know, architecture, these things are closely wound. Us. I think that's probably the most important thing to say. But of course we know that water, and let me turn to the, the water question, we, we know that water is, in li water is the big deal in climate change. It's not so much, I mean, there are places where the heat stress and so on will matter, and there are places where the changes to the growing seasons and when it gets hot, they also matter. But the big deal is water. I mean, the, the impacts of climate change are water or its absence in some shape or form. Floods, sea level rise, extreme weather events, desertification. Um, and let me just give one example, which, let me give two examples. One example is city design. And we all know, although people often forget, that um, on the whole water supplies go underground and roads go on the ground. Uh, this is really basic stuff here. And uh, it makes an awful lot of sense to plan your water supply and how that's going to go before actually you build all your road systems because you make life much more difficult. So designing those things in is a fundamental. And I think actually what we can do, and I, I'm, I'm thinking in, in response, and you're the one who's experienced in these areas, but these issues of city design could put things like uh, water absolutely at the forefront and build, as it were, the uh, adaptation and mitigation and development into those things. Because we know that cities are very vulnerable. I mean, you just have to look at Mumbai in 2005, more or less the same time as Katrina, but it got much less uh, publicity. It's poor people in cities who get, get hit uh, earliest and uh, hardest. So I think that those stories of um, water and, and uh, city design would allow us to go after these uh, low-cost loans that I've been advocating um, in a way which would make a very big difference. Now, the more grants you can get, the better, but if you can change the cost of capital from 6% to 3 or 2%, surely makes a huge difference your ability to service those loans. I mean, Chicago can borrow 100 basis points. Sao Paulo is 800 basis points. You try to make infrastructure investment in Sao Paulo at 800 basis points. Those are the kinds of things we, we have to do. The more we can get grants, the better. But grants aren't going to cover the kind of uh, sums that we're talking about. And uh, so I think that uh, design and bringing down 
cost of capital, doing those things together would be enormously important. Technology enormously. You, 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 you're aware of a company called Takadu? Uh, Takadu. They have re it's an Israeli company, and they've really had a, made a big difference to uh, managing water systems in, in London. And what you do is you um, put a number of pressure meters around the water system, and with a, just a little bit of modeling and calculation, uh, it says you, your leak is here. Yeah? And so you don't dig up along the whole thing to find out where the leak is. You calculate where the leak is. So you can fix things much more quickly. And of course, that is, again, mitigation, adaptation, uh, development. So I think it's a combination of these things. I mean, you're the water specialist, uh, I'm not. But the other example I would use was um, when I was working at the World Bank, I went to Lowest Plateau, and you stand on this thing and, and on a hill, and one way behind you it's desert, and the other way it's green. And that's essentially water management, water harvesting, uh, terracing, and uh, getting rid of the goats, who are terrible. Uh, you know, eat them or something, but, uh, mm -hmm. but not if you're vegetarian. And um, the, uh, the, it's a very different example, but it's surely another example of mitigation, adaptation, development all tied together. If you lose the soil, you're losing a carbon sink. Yeah? Um, if you lose the soil, you're losing the output and the uh, development. If you lose the soil, you're still more vulnerable in your agriculture. So uh, those are just two examples. But they, if we just bring mitigation, adaptation, development, the obvious thing, in other words, clean and climate resilient development, if we think that way and organize that way, it's tremendous what, what we can do. Thank you. Uh, uh, what was the other uh, one? The other one was the other public one was, health, um, well, the other one was, uh, and the management of the disaster, disaster risk. And, and disaster risk. I, I don't know the answer to how well we can uh, integrate that. It, it, just to recap on Paris, you've got the agreement itself, which is the legal text. You, know, you bind yourself to certain measures of measure, certain ways of doing the measuring and the, doing the reporting. You bind yourself to come back every five years, and so on. The second thing, the uh, the intended nationally determined contributions, we've already discussed at some length. Uh, they're numerical, but they're not binding. But they're to be taken seriously, because most of the numbers that people put down for Copenhagen, Cancun, they look set to deliver for 2020. Certainly the US and China and, uh, and Europe look set to deliver. That's the second thing. The third thing is the finance, which we've discussed a little bit. But the fourth is the action agenda, which is really a catch-all, but a very exciting, interesting catch-all, actually. Uh, but think particularly of cities and business but also NGOs. But, um, so I've touched on the collaboration amongst uh, cities. We've talked a little bit uh, about the business story. It seems to me that's the kind of area, those last two, in the finance and in the action agenda, where it's possible to get some uh, progress. But how well it's going to be integrated, I, I, I honestly don't know. I suspect you're much closer to that than, uh, than I am. Okay. But clearly it makes sense. So let, let's go on to another end. So Nick, you've, uh, you've offended two groups, which is um, vegetarians and leaving out goats. No, I didn't. I said, um, if you're a vegetarian, don't eat goats. People from Atlanta. <laughs> I rather, so we're, I rather we're prove a vegetarian. I'm not vegetarian, but I rather prove a vegetarian. So. Okay, so so let's go to the third round of uh, third round of questions. In front row. Nothing I can do about Atlanta. Um, Tim Ashby from Adam Smith International. Um, before I came here today, I caught some of the debate that was going on in the House of Commons around the build-up to the, the Paris COP. Um, and a rough estimate, uh, looking around the, the empty green benches, was that there were maybe 15 MPs in, in, in the chamber, um, three or four ministers, shadow ministers, Caroline Lucas, and about eight or ten who'd actually decided to come along, not entirely clear whether they were paying any attention, most had their heads down in papers. Does that continuing lack of political resonance and engagement surprise you, and does it matter? Okay. Uh, James. Thanks, Kevin. You've touched upon many of these points already. I was craving a kind of communications message, as if on the last day of Paris, 
the agreement as you describe it falls into place and those four pillars are visible and Laurent Fabius stands up and says this is the Paris outcome. Um, what do you think are the, are the key uh, messages to communicate to the kind of audience that we have here? What, what, is, the, what is the takeaway, the thing to do the next day for the audience in this room and wh where, where are the priorities for implementing the Paris outcome? Thanks, James. Um, are there other questions? Please, front, front row. Uh, Carl Allen, uh, you spoke a lot about China. Now, China, China has recognized the Marx system of climate change, mutually assured destruction, if we can use it as an analogy. What is China's message to Paris if Paris does not make a suitable agreement? So I didn't, what, was the, what was the last part of that question? It doesn't make a what? If Paris doesn't make an agreement that China can live with, how will China use its power then? Okay, thanks. And then one, one more question. Um, thank you. I'm Jenny Yates. I work for the Elders. Um, you mentioned the great importance for the world of um, India not locking in a high <coughs> emissions trajectory through um, installing so much coal-fired um, energy generation. Do you think that the UK should do more with its international climate finance to help India lower the cost of capital of, for renewables? And specifically, what should the UK do? Thank you. So I think the first two on the politics and the messaging, uh, third on China and then... Yeah. I, I think that, that actually picks up in a very concrete way a broader point you made about the importance post-Paris of thinking of technology, incentives for technology transfer and cooperation. Yeah, in particular the last point there. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, was I surprised by the lack of political engagement, if that's the correct interpretation of what you saw? Uh, your interpretation, not mine, but would I be surprised? No. Is it worrying? Yes. And um, if you ask people, all these things depend on how you put the question and the circumstances. I mean, if you ask people, is climate change and global warming a problem in a room that's hot, you get different answers than if you ask them that question if a room that's less hot. So you've got to remember that the way you put the question and the circumstance in which that question <laughs> is answered. Uh, you know, if you ask people about climate change in the torrential rain, you're going to get a different answer. So. Um, make an allowance for that. On the whole, uh, people will say climate change is a serious problem. And there's, I think, an upward trend in that. But if you ask them what is the most serious problem, they won't necessarily put climate very high. And we've got to ask ourselves a reason for that. And you can blame the physics. Essentially, the physics tells us that... Um, this is something whose outcome is very uncertain. The human beings, we know intuitively, but the psychologists have shown it endless number of times, are very bad at thinking about and dealing with making decisions under uncertainty. It's right out, potentially right outside our experience. We haven't seen three degrees on this planet, uh, which in some scenarios is pretty likely. We haven't seen three degrees on this planet for three million years. Our societies are basically post the last ice age, Holocene period of just plus or minus one degree, and we're already on the edge of that. So right outside experience, potentially, hugely outside experience. Thirdly, a lot of it's quite long term, at least the big numbers. And fourthly, it's a public good. It's the sum total of all the emissions that matter. That, all that straight physics, right? That's four things, each, any one of which would have made this a very difficult problem for communication. When we, uh, at the, it's a critically important question, I've got a moment or two on it. it. If you think of the big changes we made in international collaboration, they were, they were all really right after the Second World War. And we'd seen two world wars and a Great Depression. There was blood everywhere, and you had to believe that there was a better way of running the world. You had to believe that we ought to be designing collaboration in a much 
better way. So we brought in uh, the UN itself, we brought in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we brought in the Bretton Woods institutions, including the WTO. We, we, um, uh, we act in Europe, where, which is one of the most violent, vicious continents in world history, we noticed that we'd been killing each other for a few hundred years, and we said this is a very bad idea, and uh, let's try collaborating and integrating our economies much better. And you know, it eventually became coal and steel and the common market and the European community and the European Union. And we did react, but we reacted to something we'd experienced very intensely. Now this something, uh, and, uh, and we, that's the process of evolution. You learn that when things go very badly wrong and you understand why, then you might try to find better ways of doing it. This we have to anticipate. If we wait till the really big stuff comes along, until we're experiencing 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4 degrees, it's too late. You, know, you, you can't turn the clock back. Uh, you've got the, the concentrations, the stock in the atmosphere that you can't get out quickly. So um, that's our problem. And that's why communication now is so important. And it's also why I think communication, and this actually takes me to um, James's question, it's very important that we use Paris to anticipate, because this is all about thinking about the longer term consequences of our actions. So we must use Paris to say, we have made a turning point, we have all got together, we're not in the rich country, poor country, narrow, uh, divisive mode that we were before. We have made, all of us, efforts to think about uh, growing in a different way and um, moving the, along the transition to low carbon economy and have actually presented most of us policies to do it. Let's welcome that but say we also have to say because we understand the science that this is much too slow. So the question then becomes that question. <coughs> it, it shrieks at you. How do we accelerate? That is the Paris question. So it seems to me the role of the NGOs, the role of communications, should be positive about what's been done, recognition, recognizing the gap, and then focusing the discussion entirely on the process of acceleration, including uh, adaptation, of course, because that's going to move uh, strongly to at least the impacts and they'll be coming through ever more strongly. So that's, I think, uh, James, how we should try to do it. There's an enormous obligation, actually, here. And you do hear some NGOs saying, yet again, those dirty, uh, monopolistic, capitalistic uh, hyenas of leaders around the world have sold the, uh, uh, the nations and the regions and the world as a whole short, and we're all going down the plug hole or into the fire or whatever metaphor that uh, you use. I, I think that would be gravely damaging and actually inaccurate in description. Um, it would be both those things. So I think being realistic about what's been achieved, but at the same time recognizing the turning point and the potential now for acceleration. So we all talk about then the low carbon transition, how we do it, how are we going fast enough, are we realizing all the great benefits that we can see there potentially from uh, energy efficiency and different ways of doing things and clean air. So you, you get enthusiastic about the responsibilities and you try to hold the political system and the economic system account for delivery of something that is basically really attractive. It is not a sacrifice. It involves big investment and radical change and of course dislocation is part of that story. But these are really good investments and the challenge is how do we make them and how do we make the changes. It's very important I think to uh, to tell that story. China and Paris, well China is now a leader and uh, China is thinking hard, sometimes struggling with the notion of being a leader but a few years ago China gave up the idea that there was this world stage into which it was entering and it sees very clearly now, and they think about it and talk about it in great uh, detail and intensity, how do we become responsible leaders? It's very much the language of Xi Jinping, but that discussion has been going back five or ten years now, but it's become much more structured and clear and external uh, as we've gone on. I think China uh, will be constructive in Paris. Um, I think China's 13th five-year plan 
uh, will be a strong change of direction uh, into making uh, the environment and climate much more central to the story. China will lead the presidency of the G8 of the G20 next year, and uh, they're being China being Chinese and thinking ahead and working out what matters, they're already uh, planning in great detail as to what they're going to do there. So I think China will lead in Paris, and it's always possible that something will go wrong. I don't think so, but it's always possible something will go wrong. I think China would carry on uh, with that leadership now, because it's got there through careful analysis of what matters to China and what matters to the world, in terms of the risks of, of climate change, the risks of air pollution, uh, the opportunities that there are in new technologies, and a direct analysis of how China's behavior affects other people's behavior. So I think China will carry on, and I think China's going to be a constructive force in, uh, in Paris. Probably still quietly. China doesn't grandstand at these things, but I, I think behind the scenes they're going to be in a, a constructive uh, force. But it'll be the first time, really, that China will be there as a leader, uh, consciously itself and recognized by others, as opposed to being part of a group. And um, we'll see how that plays out. So it's actually quite an important political moment in terms of China's role in the world. But uh, I'm reasonably optimistic about it. But they certainly, they, China doesn't do throwing toys out of the pram. I mean, that, they don't, uh, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Um, and I hope there's no reason to get so cross that that's what you might be tempted uh, to do. Um, the last one was on technology transfer. And India and, and so on. Yeah. I, I, I was always unhappy about British aid coming out of India as fast as it did. Um, I suppose I'm a, a bit boring in thinking that, you know, if you think if you want to fight poverty, you should fight poverty where it is. You know, like the guy who kept getting arrested for robbing, robbing banks, and he said, that the judge asked him, why is it always banks? And he said, that's where the money is. <laughs> and, you know, you, you fight poverty where it is. And there's an awful lot of it in India. And, uh, but, you know, rightly or wrongly, wrongly in my view, um, uh, the UK government withdrew or is withdrawing the aid side. But, to be fair, it is still interested in technology, it is still interested in research on India. So I hope that we press very strongly. I know these were subjects of discussion when Prime Minister Modi came here, uh, intensely discussed between Prime Minister Modi and President Barack Obama. So I think there's tremendous potential for UK, US, and other countries, Germany, to work with India on, on uh, technology. It's vital for India, vital for the world that we do. I mean, 13 of the 20 most polluted cities are in India. Only one of the top 50 are in China, and it's not Beijing. Yet, living in Beijing is like smoking 40 a day. 4,000 people die each year from air pollution in China. It is much worse in India. And I'm hoping that the realization of that, which is increasing pretty rapidly in India, very rapidly in India, will help change the politics. And that screams out for technical progress and, uh, and innovation. Nick, can I? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Can I just ask you a follow up question to that? that because India is a very good example of this point. That, you know, that if you look at the cost benefit <coughs> numbers, if you price in externalities, you know, of course the returns to investment in renewables in India are enormously high. But a finance minister doesn't look at cost benefit numbers, they look, you know, look at real fiscal effects. And, and the real public finance costs for get, getting out of coal on an accelerated basis in a country that's running a, whatever it is, a 7% fiscal deficit. You know, it's a tough, it's a tough issue, you know? and I think it brings us back to the broader financing architecture for a post-Paris world. And the, I, I guess, again, to put on a pessimist hat, that a pessimist might say, of all the times where there was an opportunity to finance what you're describing, 
this was it. You know, historically low real interest rates, huge investments that aren't taking place, you know, with potentially very high returns. You know, Africa and governments borrowing in bond markets at twice the rate they could be borrowing from the IBRD, but it's, you know, the, the system doesn't facilitate it. So there, there is clearly something deeply wrong with the, fin you know, the financial architecture that we've got, that you know, we created in the pro Bretton Woods period and has evolved since, to what we need. And I guess if you, were, we, we haven't got that long left, but if you were identifying the, the short steps that can be taken to, to fix that issue, what, what, would, what would they be? I think it's uh, both on the incentive side and on the finance side. I mean, you've got to get the incentives in place so that the huge potential for investment becomes huge demand for investment. And uh, government-induced policy risk is the biggest obstacle, discouragement to investment of all, wherever you look. It might be that you don't know what's going to happen to subsidies on renewables. It might be that you don't know what the carbon price will be. It might be in some countries the risks of predation from very high levels of government or very low levels of government. It might be the inability to enforce property rights in the courts. You want to take a court case in India? I mean, you better be a young person. <laughs> um, the, uh, we have to think directly about how best we can cope. That's why I think the climate change legislation is important in the UK. You can't give people certainty in this world. The world doesn't offer certainty. But you surely can reduce uncertainty. And the right kind of institutional structures, I think, help that. And that leads me to the finance side. I was very influenced by six years as chief economist of the EBRD, which is basically an investment bank uh, with uh, support from international from governments around the world, um, but mostly investing with the private sector. There were some firms at the time I was there, at the end of 93 to, to 99, uh, some firms that could have bought the EBRD, all of it, but they still wanted to go with the IB, EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, lending into Central Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union. They, they wanted to be with the EBRD because objectively risk went down. Objectively it went down in the sense that governments were genuinely much less likely to monkey around with programs in which the EBRD was involved because they've got a long-term relationship with the EBRD as members of the EBRD. The EBRD is better at uh, convening. Does anybody here work for Goldman Sachs? Well, let me use that as an example then. <laughs> the, um, and I've got friends who do, and they love me anyway. But the, suppose Goldman rings up and says, hey, Kevin, I've got this fantastic opportunity. Just give me a few billion, maybe, well, maybe five, and I'll look after it very well for you because I've got this fantastic uh, opportunity here. You don't have to do anything. Just you know, give me the money and I'll make sure you get a really good return. I obviously exaggerate a bit. Um, on the other hand, and you, you, you'd be very careful, right? Now, if the EBRD says, well, look, I've been looking hard at this area of the economy for a long time and here's a very what looks like a very good project. I've got these three banks quite likely to come in. If they came in, would you come in? I mean, that's a convening power which turns enormously on trust. Now, if a development bank is run well, I mean, that's an important if, but if it is run well, then it can create that kind of trust. It can create uh, combinations of skills and uh, focus. There are a number of reasons why you can bring down how you, through good development banking, I mean, not just loans for the friends, but with good development banking, you can bring down the cost of capital. So I think you have to look for stability in policy, and there are ways of doing that. And the UK has been good in parts. I mean, it, climate change, I won't talk about where well, it's not so good, but we can work that out. The, uh, the climate change legislation is, is a good part of the UK story. And then we have to think much harder about the development banks. I welcome enormously the Chinese initiatives in the new banks. I was very much involved in the creation of the 
New Development Bank, the BRICS Bank in Shanghai. I'm quite closely associated with the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Those are ways in which we can start, I think, to build and recreate the system. Just at the moment, I think looking for the World Bank at, to be leaders is difficult. Difficult because of where they are and their relationship with the United States and the Congress not ready to vote money, but also not ready to have its shares diluted if other people come in. But I do think that, uh, and I hope it comes from Paris and beyond, a real reinvigoration of the role of the multilateral development banks and the development banks. If they can move to lending 200 billion a year and you can bring in multipliers of three, four, five, you're starting to move into the trillion range. And I genuinely think that's possible. And all the knock-on effects that the examples have. So I think there's real, real potential there. But it's, gonna, it's going to be, have to be radical and imaginative. Frustrating things, we can see how to do it. Yeah. OK, um, so that, that's great. So we've got um, Atlanta, Goats, and Goldman Sachs. That was the hat trick I was, uh, <laughs> I, I was hoping for. I love them all. <laughs> um, Nick, that, that, that was amazing, and I think some real insights for all of us. Yeah, there are a couple of things for me that uh, a take-home message for us in ODI, actually, as we think beyond Paris, which is, first, that we need to see this as the beginning of the process and, uh, and to look at how we accelerate post-Paris. And I think there are some very distinctive research and development challenges that you've outlined, you know, some of them around the financial architecture. And I, you know, and I'm often struck, actually, I think we've sort of got locked into this Bretton Woods governance d debate. And the world has moved on so dramatically and nowhere more so than infrastructure yeah. financing. And so I, I think that's, you know, that's certainly one of the areas that we need to look at. We're already doing <coughs> quite a lot of work, actually, with the colleagues in NCE on uh, urban futures and cities. So uh, I think that's another key area. And I think the third one are these links between poverty, climate risk, and development in the way that you outlined them of, of trying to break through some of these silos that have been created and looking at it in a, in a much more integrated way. So we're probably going to bring you back in in um, January post Paris to help us think through our own strategy looking ahead. But until then, Nick, you, you thank you. Thank you.